Okay, up next we do have another one of our uh, lovely black feather poets coming out. Phyllis Spencer is a lifelong Alaskan poet, mother, and someone who cares about the challenges facing our great state. She is an artist and thought-provoking poet. Please welcome Phyllis Spencer. Thank you. I'm going to use the podium because I have a paper to read from. Um, I just want to say I'm glad I'm here tonight. Uh, half a Nupiaq Eskimo. I grew up in the Anchorage area. And growing up in Anchorage, it's, uh, domestic violence is something that you see. And a lot of your friends and family, they don't have to be any certain kind of race. But you see it everywhere. It's always unspoken. Nobody ever says anything. They're afraid to do anything about it. And I'm so happy I could be here even at the last minute so I could send that message out to people that you know, even if, if you're not sure if it's happening, if you could talk to the people and try to get them some help, it would um, make a big difference for generations to come because it's always multi-generational. People grow up thinking it's normal, and it's not. We can make the world a better place starting from here, one at a time. Um, my poem is called When Violence Hits Home. She tried to get a divorce, a dissolution, and a marriage, stating irreconcilable differences coupled with domestic violence. She feels her beloved Steve is no longer what she needs. But his scare tactics frightened his object of obsession into submission. He accused her of betrayal. He had an unhealthy fixation with an imagined transgression. So how could she leave? But how could she stay? He blames the victim. She blames herself. He makes excuses. Unbridled envy, unchecked anger, passionate rage. He says whatever he needs to get what he wants. Truth and lies blur together, creating confusion with lack of reason. And forgiveness comes easy when manipulation is commonplace. Financial dependency coupled with her uneducated insecurities. He pays the bills. He buys the food. And they have no other place to go. And sometimes she wished she was a home so she would have protection and a place to go. He knew what buttons to push to turn her into blundering mush. Words jumbled, brain rumbled, unable to speak and paralyzed by fear. She endeared the anguish just to keep the baby near. And after years of being treated like an idiot, a half-wit, a hair-brained dimwit, a piece of eye candy dangled at his arm, love for his charm, it leaves her dumbfounded, barefoot and in need. He is her beloved steed, a hero to her children, she conceives, due to the mouths he feeds. Forced suppression turns to regression without expression. Paralyzed by fear while under duress, she retreats in concession and slips into depression. And he gets her a prescription for mind-numbing medication, which furthers her alienation due to fear of retaliation in lieu of his infatuation with an imagined transgression. And when unwanted attention turns to painful penetration, penetration Intimacy turns to repulsion. The stank of his skin, the crack of his voice, his false accusations continue to condemn her virtue. Not true. She made a promise, and she took his name. She made her bed, and she must lie in it. And she lies in it. Or not. Perhaps she will file that paperwork, take the baby, move away, and get some help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Our next performer is Sheila Sign. Please welcome Sheila to the stage. to the question, why is there so much sex and violence in your books? I read this response last year after the Viewer 2009 had taken place, and went, as an aspiring writer, I felt touched by what Ms. Pierce had written and wanted to share it with you all. 
Miss Pierce is also one of my favorite authors, and her heroines have always been an inspiration to me. Ms. Pierce's entire response, including this excerpt, can be found at her website, www.tomorrowpierce.com, and was last modified on July 10th, 2004. Sadly, violence is far more normal than our protected society wants to believe, though it is presented to us as abnormal. Look at the attention given to street violence and gang warfare in poor neighborhoods. Our culture leads us to view the poor as brutish and twisted, when they are simply frustrated with having little while others who have much live all around them. As for the rest of the world, the unprotected part, violence is part of everyday life, just as it has been throughout history. The slave trade still flourishes in our world, whether it's called slavery, child labor, or sweatshop labor. Bandits and gangs battle for money, prestige, and power all over the globe. In some parts of the world, pirates still prey on ships at sea. Governments are violently overthrown. Warlords make it impossible for everyday people to receive badly needed food and medicine. Rebels blow up trains and put their opponents in hellish prison camps. People are tortured. Murders of millions are allowed to thrive. Women and children are beaten and killed every day by men who feel they have the right to commit that violence. And that's just the modern world. In the era from his, of history from which I draw most of my ideas and cultures, we had situations like the Hundred Years' War, in which during peacetime, armies did not go home, but remained to pillage, rape, and murder at will, supporting themselves by robbing the peasants of the things they slaved to earn. Hangings were festive occasions. People brought picnic lunches. While the corpses of the executed were left on public display for the education of the people, people were tortured into confessions as a common part of police procedure. Not that there were any police, not until the late 1700s in some places. Instead, neighborhoods were patrolled by people who could be every bit as violent and cruel as the criminals they were supposed to be looking for. For centuries, people thought that the only way children in the lower classes would learn a lesson would be if they were hit or kicked to make it stick. Lady Jane Grey, 16, was beaten for two days by her parents until she agreed to bear guilt for a Dudley. The Crusaders instigated mass slaughters of Jewish populations in the Catholic cities they passed through, and of non-Catholic Christians and Jews in the Middle Eastern cities they visited. Tamerlane, in his conquest, left pyramids of human skulls in his wake. That is how the world was. I believe that sanitizing this aspect of, modern and, of the modern and ancient world is at the root of our problems as a culture now. We're bred to be smug about how peaceful we are so we can watch the television and feel safely distant from violence when it is part of our makeup. That smugness means we don't feel we have to do anything about the violence we see because it's obviously committed by people who are as educated or civilized as we are. By holding ourselves aloof from global and historical violence, we allow it to continue. If we are ever to survive as a species, we need to admit that we are violent and find ways to ease the plight of victims of violence worldwide. No, invading a violent country and bombing it will not inspire its people to give up violence. Go figure. We must face who we are and what creates violence. Helplessness, envy, rage, even the, the drive to grab the good things of the world that are flaunted in the faces of the poor. We must take responsibility and protect each other from violence. That is why there is violence in my books, although even I sanitize my violence. If I were to write the true, constant, vicious, grotesque violence of history, or of the contemporary world, say on the level it's been practiced in Rwanda and Cambodia in my lifetime. I would not be allowed to publish books for kids at all. I pull my punches. I try to walk the balance between showing that we are a violent species and that we must recognize it and deal with it, and wallowing just how very badly human beings treat each other within their homes, hidden in woods and fields, on our roads and in our skies. I want to emphasize heroes not mindless brutality, and the courage of the kind of people who say, enough, it stops here. That is why I will continue to include violence in my writing. I have been a victim of violence. The only way I know to put a stop to it is to stand against it, gain for myself a safe zone where there is no violence, and bring, then bring others into it. If you want to ignore the violent world around us, if you want to tell yourself that we are better and more civilized 
than other people, then perhaps you shouldn't read my books. I tend to be very cynical about those ideas. For us to change, we have to look at the thing that needs to be changed and make it stop. Not watch it on television and say to each other, it's the only thing they'll respond to. We need to respond to it. We need to face it, even in books, even in fantasy.